milliard. God told the children of Israel out of Egypt. Ten horrific plagues had battered the lands of Egypt. He took them through the Red Sea and gave them a little rinse off and a baptism. And the first thing he wanted to do was to change the Egyptian guide. But they didn't want it. They didn't want the man. They argued and they murmured and they wished they could return back to Egypt over food. Listen, church. Over food, they was willing to go back into servitude and slavery. And it was the mixed multitude that was the problem. You see, they left Egypt out of fear of the plagues and death that rather leave in Egypt because they wanted to be faithful to the living God. And we got some mixed multitudes in the church of the living God. There was two main instances. The first one was in Numbers chapter 11. The children of Israel murmured and argued with God. And he murmured and argued with God and God said, right, I'm going to give you the meat. I'm going to give you if you want it. I'm going to give it to you but I'm not going to give it to you for one day, neither two days, neither five days, neither 10 days, neither 20 days. I'm going to give it to you for one whole month until it come out of your nose. So he did. God sent quail from the sea. And I was thinking about it. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on now. Think with me, church. Think with me, church. There was over 600,000 men of war with their wives, with their children, with their teenage sons and daughters. So there was over 2 point plus million people who God said he's going to feed for one whole month with quail. The Bible said there was a wind coming from the sea. You know where birds originally came from? <laughs> when you go into the Bible, you'll see that the Lord made the birds. And somehow they was created from the waters. And somehow God created these crowds from the waters. And he made so much of them. That Moses said it was a day's journey that way. A day's journey that way. It was two cubits high. Hold on. It's not a Sabbath day's journey, which is two miles. It was a day's journey. How far can you walk in a day? You can easily walk 10 to 15 miles. You mean to tell me that when you look, all you see is pure quails, 50 miles, 50 miles, 50 miles, 50, for one whole month. And you know what happened? Why they got their, 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 their quail and their birds, God just looked down from them from heaven, and he sent lightning upon them, the most guiltiest. God buried them. Moses buried the people. And you know what the graves were, were, were you know what the graves were called? Kibroth Hatava. Kibroth Hatava. The graves of those that lusted. There's another instance. In Numbers 25. Oh, they joined into a feast with no bags and worship bell pure. You see, they got they said, oh, we can't ask God for meat no more. So you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna join our neighbors with the Midianitish whores. Got the leading men. And they started to eat the meat the way the pagans eat it. And guess how the pagans eat it with? The blood and the fat. And they bowed down and they worshipped an idol demon. What did God say? 
God told Moses, listen, take every single one of those people who was partaking of Baal Peor and hang their heads up to the sun. You know, the Bible says this, there's over 24,000 people who was hanged up in one day. Over 2 million people have left Egypt. You know how much survived? Two. Not even Moses made it. He didn't even make it to the promised land. But bless God, I was listening to it this morning when I was driving down. That when my God said, listen, don't talk about it no more. You're not going into the promised land. Jesus came from a couple of days after he was buried. And you know when the angels buried him, they came down with Jesus. And they resurrected Moses and brought him up to heaven. Amen. Where do you really want to be for eternity? You want to be in heaven? All right, let's go and see how it is going to be like in heaven. Testimony to the church, page 140. Appetite is the great law that governs men and women generally. It's what? It governs you. You are what you eat. You can't run from it. And what does the pen of inspiration say to us living in the clothes of probation? Listen to what the pen of inspiration says. The controlling power of appetite will prove the ruin of not just thousands now, millions! When if they had conquered on this point, what point? The point of appetite. They would have had come moral power to gain a victory over every other temptation of Satan. But those who are slaves to appetite, you're going to fail. You know why I'll preach this message? Because if you keep on staying in darkness, the appetite what you have will make you fail in perfecting Christian character. You'll always be in the church arguing and fussing and cussing and making a whole heap of noise. You don't always not have time to worship the living God. We need to put God first. Amen. And that's what many of us are not doing. And Satan knows that. The continued transgression of man for 6,000 years has brought sickness, pain, and death. It's clutch as its fruits. And as we near the close of time, Satan's temptation to indulge appetite will be more powerful and more difficult to overcome. Oh, brothers and sisters, Satan is constantly on the alert. He's on the what, church? He's on the alert to bring the race fully under his control. But he's not going to do it because God's going to have somebody, somebody who loves him and keeps his commandments. Is that you? Amen. But I go to church. So what? Satan come to church too. His strongest hold on man is through what, church? His strongest. You see, because it's the appetite that will cause you to commit adultery. It's the appetite that will cause you to watch soap opera. It's the appetite that will make you have a type of temp a temperament where you want to argue with your church brothers and sisters. It's your appetite that will make you be stiff naked. <laughs> and this he seeks to stimulate in every possible way. You see, appetite is at the foundation of our spiritual walk. Once we gain this victory, we can gain every other victory in our sojourn to heaven. Diet and appetite is the key. Oh, I heard a lot of men talking about prophecies and talking about this and talking about that and they preach great messages. But you know where the true message is? It's how you are with God. And how you are with God bases upon your character. And how your character is, is based upon what you eat and drink because you will either strengthen the lower passions or strengthen the higher passions. You can make that choice. And there's three important areas of difference. Because <laughs> many people don't realize, you see, diet is the quality of our nutritional intake. Your diet is your quality, but your appetite is your quantity of the amount of food we eat. And many of us have a problem with our appetite. We eat too much. But then there's lifestyle. It's your activity. Levels by ex <coughs> exercise. See, there's a difference between diet and appetite. Diet is one thing, but appetite is another. You can just look at some people and know they have a problem with appetite. 
God gave us three gifts from heaven, from Eden. And it's constantly under attack. Marriage is constantly under attack. Your diet is constantly under attack. The Sabbath is constantly under attack. And I was warned. I remember when I was just coming into the church and I kind of started to get a lot for the health message. And one man has been in the church for over 20 odd years. He warned me. He said, Evangelist, you're young. You're just coming to church. Watch it. Because Satan hates the most people who merge the health message with the doctrine. He just hates it when you merge health message with the everlasting gospel. He says, if you preach prophecy, yeah, you get problems, but you should be all right. But once you start preaching health and you mix it, he says, you're going to get problems. You're going to have problems in your marriage. You won't even be able to have a proper marriage. You're going to have problems in your job. You're going to have problems with your evil, with your health. You're going to have problems with your friends. You're going to have problems with your church, brothers and sisters. And he said, listen, let me tell you something. If you make up your mind, evangelists, to preach a health message mixed with doctrine and, prof and prophecy, don't look for nobody to be a friend on planet Earth. Amen. Because you're going to have pure problems. And you know what? I've been preaching now for near enough 25 years since 1990, and his word has come so true to me. How's your life? You think you're going to go to heaven on a bed of roses? Be careful how you live, and how you eat, and how you drink, because it will affect you. True Christianity is all about surrendering of the will to the Holy Spirit like a child. This I say then, hear what Paul says, walk in the Spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusts up against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are what, church? They're contrary to one another. So that you cannot do the things that you would, but if you're led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, and that word comes again, lasciviousness. You are lustful pervert. Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, that means competition. Wrath, strife, sedition, that means you riot, heresies, endings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I've also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God, but the fruit of the Spirit is what, church? Not fruits. Fruit. That means you need to have all of it. You can't have part of the Holy Ghost. You need all of him. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness. And what's the next word, church? So if you say you're a child of God, then you must be temperate. Because that is part of the fruit of the Holy Ghost. And if you are in temperate, you have another spirit. And I'm not taking back my talk neither. And they that are Christ's, are you Christ's today? You have crucified the flesh with the affections. Remember what Paul said in the bottom part, but I keep under my body and I bring it into subjection. He said by any means, when I preach to others, I myself shall be a castaway. And this is what I want to say to you today. The purpose of temperance is to subjugate, to inflict a blow, to discipline a level of slavery of the body to the mind. So the mind can control the body's natural and unnatural passions and desires. That's what temperance is for, to bring subjugation. Why, preacher? Why? Is it just so we ourselves can resist the temptation of Satan at last be saved in God's kingdom? It is just for me? No, sir. Listen to what the pen of inspiration says. Listen to what the pen of inspiration says. Fathers, as well as mothers, listen, listen, are involved in this responsibility. What responsibility? 
Both parents transmit their own characteristics, mental and physical, their dispositions and their appetites to their children. As the result of parental intemperance, children often lack physical, strength and mental and moral power. Liquor drinkers and tobacco users may and they do transmit their insatiable cravings, their inflamed blood and irritable nerves to their children. The licentious often bequeath their unholy desires and even loathsome diseases as a legacy to their offspring. Listen, church. And as the children have less power to resist temptation that had the parents a tendency for each generation to fall lower and lower, to a great degree, parents are responsible not only for the violent passions and perverted appetites of their children, but for the infirmities of the thousands born deaf, blind, diseased, and idiotic. Let that one sink in for a bit. Why is the temperance question so important? Because our physical health, our spiritual health, and our earthly work, and also our eternal life is at risk. And if I can say a word for someone to have their names retained in the book of life today, I'm going to say it. I'm not going to hold it back. Because I believe that God has finished judging the righteous dead and he's just waiting for the righteous living to get their act together. You think my God needs millions of years to finish judging the righteous dead? We are living in the antitypical day of atonement. How is it with you and God? Your appetite and your diet can destroy our hope of eternal life and Satan knows this. And I'll be closed in five minutes, but I'm gonna let you I'm gonna let you hear what this lady says to us now, and then you can go home and eat whatever you plan to eat. <laughs> Your business is of a character that is not friendly to advance in the divine life, but is one that will hinder the growth of grace. It would hinder the growth of grace and the knowledge of truth. It has a tendency to lower, to debase the man, to make him more animal in his propensity. The higher powers of the mind are overpowered by the lower. The brutish part of your nature governs the spiritual. Those who profess to be fitting for translation should not be butchers. Your family have partaken largely of flesh meats and the animal can touch the tongue, Jesus. And the animal propensities have been strengthened while the intellectuals have been weakened. We are composed of what we eat. And if we subsist largely upon the flesh of dead animals, we shall partake of their nature, one, and of their characteristics, two. What? What? It took me about a week to understand that. Why? Dictionary's definition of nature and characteristic. Listen. Nature, your natural behavioral and physiological traits. That's natural. That means your attributes, your features, your makeup, your species, your identity, your very essence, your nature. Oh, okay. Not just nature, but characteristics, a distinctive trait and quality. Listen, your personality, your caliber, your reputation, your integrity, your rectitude, your uprightness, your temperament. You see what she's trying to say, you know, when we take on their nature and their character, you know what she's really trying to say? We're going to look and act and take on animalistic qualities. And Satan knows that. Through appetite, Satan controls the mind. Through appetite, Satan controls the what, church? The mind and the whole being. Thousands who might have lived have passed into the grave, physical, mental and moral wrecks because they sacrifice all their powers to the indulgence of appetite. The necessity for the men of this generation to call to their aid the power of the will strengthened by the grace of God in order to withstand the temptation of Satan and resist the least indulgence of perverted appetite is far greater than it was several generations ago. But the present generation have less power of self-control than have those who lived then and Satan knows that. 
Listen to what a pen of inspiration says. A call to medical evangelism and health education. As a people, we have been given the work of making known the principles of health reform. There are some who think that the question of diet is of not sufficient importance to be included in their evangelistic work. Well, I do! But such make a great mistake who don't think it's important. God's word declares, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. The subject of temperance in all its bearings has an important place in the work of what church? Just a church? Salvation. And Satan knows that. There are those among Seventh-day Adventists who will not heed the light given them in regard to this matter. What matter? They make flesh meat a part of their diet. Disease comes upon them, sick and suffering as a result of their own wrong course. They ask for the prayers of the servants of God. But how can the Lord work in their behalf when they are not willing to do His will, when they refuse to heed His instructions regard to health reform? For 30 years, I say 100 plus now, the light on health reform has been coming to the people of God, but many have made it a subject of jest. Is that you? They have continued to use tea, coffee, spices, and flesh meat, and their bodies are full of disease. Is that you? How can we ask? How can we, I ask, present such ones to the Lord for healing? As my brother plays something on the piano. In closing. Oh. You know, Satan had a meeting, he had a, a demonic conference session. And you know what happened? Is that God secretly brought Sister White into this meeting. Satan didn't know she was in there. But God said, you need to go in there and hear what Satan is saying and I want you to write it and give it to the church of God. Because they need to know what Satan's planning in the end time. Sweet out of prayer, something cool, brother. Because I know whatever bruising has been going on. <laughs> yeah, amen, anything cool, as long as it's cool. Hear what she says. As the people of, of, of as the people of touch my tongue, Jesus, as I read this last part. As the people of God approach the perils of the last days, Satan holds earnest consultation with his angels as to the most successful plan of overthrowing their faith. He sees that the popular churches are already lulled to sleep. But he wants to look for those who are looking for the second coming of Jesus. He says, we must watch those who are calling the attention of the people to the Sabbath of Jehovah. Because when you expose the Sabbath, they'll see the ministration of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. The Sabbath is the great question which is beside the destiny of souls. The people have accepted the administered explanations why they should go to church on Sunday. Therefore, we need to continue to work for the leaders. But our principal concern is to silence this sect of Sabbath keepers. We don't like them. Listen, Satan don't like you, though. No. You're no friend of Satan. Though you may enjoy his television programs and his music and his dresses, He says, we will enforce certain laws for them to disregard this, this, this Sabbath which we hate. And we'll drive them out of the cities and the villages and we're gonna make them suffer hunger and privation. And we, will, and we led the Romish church to inflict imprisonment, but in the later times we're gonna get the Protestant churches in the world to be in harmony with the right arm of our strength. You know what the right arm of our strength is? Sunday worship. And there are many who are ranked with Sabbath keepers who don't want to get persecuted who come over to our side. 
She says, but before proceeding to these extreme measures, we must exert all our wisdom and subtlety to deceive and ensnare those who honor the true Sabbath. So now he's going to use subtlety. Listen to his subtlety. We can separate many from Christ by his worldliness, lust, and pride. Listen now. They may think themselves safe because they believe the truth. Satan knows that we think we're okay because we believe in the truth. But indulgence of appetite or the lower passions will confuse their judgment and destroy discrimination and will cause their fall. You think Satan don't know you're in here? You think that man, this message was too hard. Let me tell you something. Satan's not playing with us no more. He never did play with us, but he's not even playing with us even now. <clears throat> and I want to let you know some of us have some major problems with our appetite. How much we eat. Some of us have some problems with our diet. What we eat. And God is calling you to make a U-turn. You don't have to. You can just carry on just the same way you've been going on. But Satan knows if he can get you on your appetite and your diet, he's got you. And we're not having no last hymn. You know what we're going to do? We're going to pray for ourselves. Because you know what? The message this evening, when I think about it, it offends me. And we need to be prepared to be able to hear the word of God and say, right, Lord, I'm going to live up to what you just showed me. Now, 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 some of you heard this message this morning. And there are some things which I know are troubling you. And I'm going to open up the doors of the church. And we're going to pray for ourselves and we're going to pray for us collectively as a church. You know why? Because somebody needs to be delivered this morning. And I don't know if that's you. But we're going to stand and we're going to sing a song. Which song are we going to sing? And then the doors are open for the church. And anybody who needs power for God's grace to change their diet and appetite and to get their life in harmony with God's will, the door is open for the church. And my brothers and my sisters, we're going to pray and ask for the power of God to take hold of us this day. Obviously, all the way, my Savior needed. Let's stand and let's sing all the way, my Savior needs. Five one six. struggling to come to church, much less with their diet and appetite. Today, make a choice for God to take control of your life in every area of your life. And if that's you, just come. Don't worry about no one else. Just come. We're into salvation. And God is looking for someone who we can grab today and say, I'm going to make you my son or my daughter. If that's you, just come. I want to pray with you this morning. Come. Sing the second verse now. Sing verse, second verse. Who's the first?
that's going to come and say, Lord, please, 